Welcome to the PCN Capital Preview. I'm Francine Scherzer. Today we'll talk about paying for college. You can join our discussion by calling us toll free at 1 877 PA 6 5001 or text us at 717 219 4001. But first, we're joined by Jan Murphy of Pan Life. Thanks for joining us, Jan. Thank you for having me, Francine. You wrote that the new teacher stipend program shattered expectations. Can you tell us a little bit about what the program entails and the response that it's received? Sure. Uh, you know, every once in a while, our legislature hits on something that is just wildly popular. And this program happens to be one of them. They um, appropriated $10 million in this year's budget for this uh, student teacher stipend program. And how it works is the um, anybody who's going to be doing their student teaching next year ha can apply and they would um, if they're lucky, <laughs> they'll receive a $10,000 stipend. If they go to um, do their student teaching in a school district where there's a, they have a hard time attracting teachers or student teachers, they would get an extra $5,000. So it would be a $15,000 stipend. And then the teacher that's mentoring them would get $2,000. So that that's, and then in exchange for this money, the students have to commit to teaching in Pennsylvania in either a public or non-public school for three years. And this program, it um, went live on last week and uh, on Thursday. And within the first three hours, they had over 3,000 applications. Now, keep in mind, $10 million is only going to fund between 600 and 700 stipends. So, and it's it's being awarded on a first come first serve basis. So there's going to be a lot of kids disappointed unless the funding gets increased. And I checked with the Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency, which is administering this program on Friday at five o'clock and they had 4,630 applicants that had been applications that had been submitted. So, um, uh, you know, last week, whenever uh, they, they had a news conference and they said, you know, about how this response is like they anticipated it being big. But on Friday, the um, PSC or I'm sorry, Thursday, the PSEA president put out a statement saying this shatters all expectations. Have it lawmakers, really oh, I'm sorry, have lawmakers or the Shapiro administration talked at all about whether they would be willing to consider expanding the program further in light of this reaction it's received? Well, that's what they, um, Fia had said that, you know, they're telling people if, you know, even if you haven't applied yet, keep applying because this, this gives them an ability to quantify to the legislators how much more money is needed. And um, they, Governor Shapiro in his budget proposed 15 million, but again, that is not clearly going to be enough to cover all the student teachers. And um, some legislators are calling for 75 million. I've heard PSEA say 62 and a half million is what is needed. And um, the, the problem with if it's not fully funded, um, what could happen is you could have two student teachers in a school building, one getting a stipend and one not getting a stipend. And it's that inequity that um, I'm sure is going to cause people to keep pressuring the legislature and the governor to put more money into this program. What needs to happen legislatively for this program to expand? Well, it just basically needs to be, you know, more money in next year's budget. And they could, if even putting it in the 24-25 state budget, they could use some of that money to cover the, the students doing the student teaching in the spring semester of next year, which is the most popular time when students, because it's their final semester of their teacher preparation program. And um, so it's, you know, it, it it it's still these students that have applied. I mean, they shouldn't like think, oh, you know, I, I know I wasn't one of the first 600 or 700. <laughs> Don't give up because <laughs> there I, I truly do think that there could be some more money coming because there's Republicans and Democratic legislators who are behind this program and pushing for more funding. Where does this issue fall politically? Oh, it's it's popular. I mean, they. they uh, they see that there is, well, there's a crying need for, for teachers in, in Pennsylvania. I, last week, Laura Boyce from Teach Plus talked about how um, our supply, it, it was just, it's just stunning to think about this. She said right now, the Department of Education is issuing more emergency certificates than the traditional certificates that go to a teacher who's fully qualified. And um, I, she said, we have, we lose 10,000 teachers a year you know, either retirement or just, you know, they need out, they want out of the profession. But 
Um, and she said that we have 9,000 vacancies currently, vacancies or else people filled with emergency certificates. So it, Pennsylvania, but we're not alone. I mean, that, that the problem is that this is a nationwide issue and, um, and they, you know, people are calling it a crisis. And I, I know sometimes that word gets used, you know, a lot, but it does, you know, there, there's people that are very much concerned about, you know, going forward, you know, how our education system will adapt if we don't get more teachers into the classroom. Do other states have a similar stipend program for student teachers? Well, there's a couple that do, and um, but this idea is so new that we really don't know if this is going to make a dent in in the need for more teachers. But um, and speaking with Laura Boyce, she said internationally this program has been tried, and um, it it does seem to have you know draw more people in and, and get them beyond that that hurdle. I mean, that's what they said in most professions when you go for an internship, you get paid. And this is kind of like an unpaid internship. You're asking people to give 12 weeks. And oftentimes, you know, kids these days have jobs in college and, and adults too that are, are, you know, deciding they want to become a teacher to, to give up all income for 12 weeks because that's what a lot of colleges say. You, you got to put your full attention to this because this student teaching experience is very critical to your career. And um, that, it's just asking a lot for people to give up all income and, and do this, this work. Jan Murphy, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Francine. More of the PCN Capital Preview after this short break. Welcome back. With college tuition often costing tens of thousands of dollars, our guests are here to provide guidance on how to pay for higher education. Joining us today, Deona Brown, manager of the Pennsylvania School Services at Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency, and also Frederick Cassivi, financial advisor at Wealth Management Services. Frederick, we'll start with you. What's the right time for parents to start thinking about paying for college? As soon as your child is born. The, the, the earliest you can start saving, the better it is. I know there's different ways when your child goes to school that you can borrow money. But uh, very important to start saving right away. There's different uh, vehicles that you can use for that. I'm sure we'll, we'll expand more on that later, but I would say the best time is right away. Same question for you, Diona. Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, as the earliest that you can start saving, the better. And I know that we're going to talk about some different uh, savings plans that are available through the state. But the earlier you plan, the better, because then you can have more of an idea as to you know, what kind of plan you want to get together, depending on what type of college the student's going to be going to. Now, Fred, we're going to start uh, talking with you in a moment about early saving options, but if someone's just beginning to think about their high schooler's education and they're going to school in a year or two, how does that change the, the plan and the strategy? If they're going to high, to high school or to college? So going to college. If you have a student, they're in high school, and you have a year or two before they start college. You, you have to... Um, start first of all you have to know what the child wants to do do they want to go to college or not um, obviously if they want to go to college uh, which colleges are they looking at um, their last year of, of high school they're gonna start applying to different colleges you have some you have uh, state schools you have uh, private schools that might be more expensive as far as the, the sticker price um, now what I would say is don't just look at the sticker price because there could be um, some some aid or some uh, grants and scholarships that will lower that price. But I think in the, your last uh, two years of high school, it's important to start uh, focusing on, on what you want to do and, and which schools. It doesn't have to be one school. You can narrow it down to four, five, six choices. But uh, I think it's important to look at which schools you're going to be looking at. Diona, what advice would you give if somebody is kind of late in the game and considering how to pay for college? I think the best thing to do is to start actually looking for scholarships right away. There's a lot of free money out there, and a lot of times that money goes wasted because people don't take the time to apply for the scholarships. So I would recommend that students start looking for scholarships and applying for those scholarships right away. There are going to be some other steps that they're going to take during their senior year when they start filling out their free application for federal student aid, but definitely focus on looking at those scholarships because there's so many available throughout the country. Frederick, one other question. If somebody is kind of late in the game, should parents ever consider using their retirement savings to help pay for school? Uh, it's an option, but it's not an option we recommend. Um, 
there, first of all, um, like Diana said, there's there's scholarships and there's uh, there, there's uh, the FAFSA application that will give you a better idea of where you stand financially and how much you're expected to contribute. Um, but take first of all, it, it depends. Everybody's different. If you're younger than 59 and a half and use your your retirement funds, you'll pay 10 percent penalty. So sometimes it's better to see what type of loan you can get. But it is an option. Uh, but definitely not an option we usually recommend for most people. We'll talk about filing the FAFSA in a few moments, but in general, will retirement savings count against parents when that, that contribution amount is being determined? No, it does not. So for the FAFSA uh, application, your, the parent assets will count, but not the retirement assets. We'll talk in a moment now about uh, you rec uh, recommended look for free money first. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing we're going to talk about briefly is savings, uh, particularly 529s. Can you give us just a very broad general overview? What are 529s and what's the benefit of having those early on? Right. So a 529 plan is a college savings plan uh, that parents can start saving for their student for college now. And they have two different plans. One, they can do it based on the type of college that the student might be looking at. And they can help start saving for uh, what those costs would be. And then it would help kind of um, keep up with the costs once the student goes to college. And I believe they also have an investment piece uh, that families can also choose to go into that. Um, and I think the benefit of that is kind of you're already thinking about putting that money away early so that when that time comes around, you already have a pocket of money that you can draw from to help with those college costs. I'd like to welcome into our discussion now Julie Peacher. She's the Deputy State Treasurer for Consumer Programs. Uh, Julie, thank you for joining us. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Pennsylvania 529 that's exclusively offered here in Pennsylvania? Absolutely. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Um, so, you know, as we've noted, um, one of the best ways to save for college is in a 529 plan. And just wanted to mention that these plans are named after Section 529 of the Internal Revenue Code. And one of the biggest benefits is the tax advantages. So a little bit more on that. Um, money saved in a 529 account grows tax-free, meaning the earnings aren't taxed annually like in a regular investment account. And then when those funds are withdrawn, um, no taxes are paid. So that really adds up to, you know, adds to the amount that, uh, you know, can go towards college. Um, so multiple tax benefits, um, which aid the overall return. Um, so a little bit about our PA 529 um, uh, college and career savings program. Um, generally, there are two types of 529 plans that we've just heard. Uh, prepaid tuition plans, which allow you to pay tuition at today's rates. Um, and the other type is simply called a savings plan, and those have more traditional investment options. Um, Pennsylvania offers both types of plans. Our guaranteed savings plan, or we like to call it the GSP for short, that allows you to choose from different tuition levels uh, based on a specific school or average of tuition at a type of school, not necessarily a specific school. And when you save enough for one credit uh, at that school today, you'll have enough to pay for that college credit in the future, no matter how much tuition increases. And some, some families prefer this since they uh, don't have to worry about the ups and downs of the financial markets. Uh, Treasury is actually managing the investments and the GSP fund takes the risk basically of making sure tuition increases are covered. Uh, sometimes prepaid plans are restricted to use at just in-state schools, but our PA 529 GSP can be used anywhere. Um, and But you do have to be a Pennsylvania resident to open an account. And uh, I also wanna mention that um, when you choose a specific school or tuition level, you can change that. You're not locked into that particular uh, school. Imagine, you know, when you open an account, you don't really know where your child is going to get uh, going to end up. You might have a sense of the type of school, um, but that can be changed later on. How does um, PA five twenty nine? I'm sorry. How does PA five twenty nine compare to other independent five twenty nines that you can get elsewhere? So our GSP is really unique um, compared to other states. A few states, maybe 10 total, have a prepaid plan like that. But ours is a little bit different and unique. Um, again, it can be used anywhere across the country and even internationally. Um, we have another plan that is similar to what other states offer. Um, that's called the investment plan or the IP. That offers a range of Vanguard funds 
Families can choose the investment options that best suit their needs. Um, portfolios with a certain mix of investments. Um, we also offer target enrollment date portfolios. And those are really popular because you can simply choose one option based on the year that the child ex is expected to go off to college. And the mix of stocks and bonds depends on how far off that is. And the asset allocation is automatically adjusted uh, every quarter. So that as you get closer to needing the funds, the asset mix becomes more conservative. So just, just a quick example on that. If someone is opening a 529 account for a child born this year, and the child might be expected to finish high school in 2042, they'd choose the 2042-2043 uh, portfolio. Right now that has 95% equities and 5% bonds. But when 2042 rolls around and the child is ready to go off, um, it'll be down to an allocation of 12% equities, 42% bonds, and 64% short-term reserves, which provides that liquidity now that the funds are going to be withdrawn. And just interestingly, my my uh, my oldest child is just turning 18 today. It's his birthday. And so he's uh, graduating high school and we're figuring out the whole the next steps. And uh, I'm thankful to let those investment experts figure out that ideal asset allocation. Now we're about to start using the funds. The website for PA 529 says investors receive protection from Pennsylvania financial aid reporting. What does that mean? That is correct. So um, in, a, in anyone, either one of our PA 529 plans, those assets do not count against any state financial aid calculations. Um, and on the on the federal side, um, you know, as uh, Frederick just talked about, um, 529 plan assets in a parent's name uh, will count towards that federal the federal aid calculation, but not as much as regular investment accounts. The website also promotes the Sage Scholars Tuition Rewards Program. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, sure. That actually is a way that automatically, um, if you just sign up for it, you get uh, points uh, added to your account and that grows over time. And those can actually be used directly for discounts at certain schools. So it's it's a unique uh, unique program to Pennsylvania and has really been used to pay uh, cover a lot of the costs of college. Is there a limit to when your child is perhaps too old to make a 529 investment worthwhile? I would say not. It can be done at any time, especially because of those tax benefits. Um, even if they're ready to go to school now, you know, they've got four years uh, of education costs. Money can be put in now and, uh, and you know, used over time. And even if there are leftover funds, um, 529 plans are great in that the beneficiary can be changed either to a younger sibling or even to um, a, a grandchild. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Do you need to be wealthy to make an investment? No, absolutely not. Um, in fact, over the past few years, uh, we have lowered our initial investment uh, to, uh, we basically in eliminated that initial deposit required and we've reduced the minimum for ongoing deposits to a dollar. So it's very affordable for anyone. If a viewer is interested in learning more, or perhaps opening up a PA 529, where should they go? PA529.com. Julie Peacher, thank you very much for joining us this morning. You're welcome. Do you know, I'd like to come back to you for a moment. Um, in, in our discussion with Julie just a moment ago, she had mentioned that the PA 529 does not count against financial aid eligibility. Is that typically the case with other 529s? It is specific to the Pennsylvania 529 plan in regards to not taking part in the Pennsylvania state grant analysis. So that's a benefit of getting the 529 in Pennsylvania. Frederick, I'd like to come back to you. Um, what should parents look for when selecting a 529 plan, whether they decide they're interested in the PA 529 and perhaps another option, whether based in Pennsylvania or elsewhere? Well, first, like uh, Julie mentioned, and she uh, gave a good definition of the 529s and all the, the features, um, you want to decide you want to do the Pennsylvania GSP where you, you somewhat buy a credit that's going to be good um, in the future, or do you want to do the PA um, Vanguard plan? And the other states, because you mentioned other states' plan, the diff another difference is that uh, Vanguard and the PA 529, they're not advisor-directed. Uh, there's other states that are advisor-directed, so uh, the person can work with someone like me, um, where we help choose the investments, uh, make the investment mix for the, for the account. Um, 
in Pennsylvania, you're allowed to deduct um, from your income, your contributions that you make to other states 529 plans. At the federal le level, they work the same. Um, so that's the, the main difference is in um, is other state sponsored 529 plans uh, can be advised or directed and uh, Pennsylvania's plans aren't. Uh, so you need to evaluate all three. If someone wants to do the GSP, that's fine. If they think they can manage their own investments and, and, and use Vanguard, that's fine also. Or if they want to use someone like, like me or someone from my team, um, they can use uh, a, a 529 plan from another state. Once a child is of college age, is there a strategy of how to best utilize your 529 savings? Um, you want to see what the cost, the out-of-pocket cost e is each year. And what I usually recommend is, is look at if you're going to be in school for four years, let's try to use some at the beginning and let's try to keep some for the end, not use everything the first year. And again, it depends. Everybody's in a different situation. It depends how much you have in that 529 plan. But if you're able to spread it out, um, I think that's a, that's a good strategy. Deanna, we'll pull you back into this. Uh, if somebody, is, their financial aid um, is being determined, the 529 counts against what their financial aid package may be. Do you have any specific advice regarding, you know, is it beneficial to utilize much of that 529 money early on with the idea of making the, the family more eligible later on in the college years? Yeah, that is, that is a strategy that some families use. Uh, another strategy is that if the grandparent actually opens the 529 plan, then it does not have to be reported on the FAFSA form, which means that it would not count against the family in regards to their assets. So that's another option that families may want to utilize if they're concerned that that might affect them with financial aid eligibility. For someone that might be completely new to this, um, can you explain what is the FAFSA form? Why is it important? The free application for federal student aid is the main financial aid form that students have to complete to see if they're eligible for any aid from the state government, the federal government. It's also a good form to fill out to see if you could be eligible for any institutional aid, which would be money directly from the colleges. So it is the main financial aid form that students have to start with to determine any type of eligibility for aid for college. What kind of financial information should you have at your fingertips when you're preparing to file this form? So you should definitely have your tax return information handy. You should have information about different assets, the balance of your checking and savings accounts, um, the different balances of uh, different CDs, anything like, anything like that, investments. Uh, all of those things are going to be asked on the FAFSA form. How long does the filing process take? Actually, this year, they've eliminated a lot of the questions. So we're seeing a lot of families being able to complete the form in about a half hour. It can be done directly on studentaid.gov, which is the Department of Education's website. So when you do the electronic FAFSA, uh, it does take a lot less time. And they can also import your tax information directly into the form to make it easier for families. We have a question that came in via text for Diona. Will the FIA board extend the May 1st deadline for FAFSA? So right now, our board is still considering that. Um, as of right now, the deadline for the FAFSA, as far as the PA state grant purposes, we would like the FAFSA to be in by May 1st. Um, but if our board decides to change that deadline, we will make a public announcement. What's the benefit of creating a FAFSA ID for the first time you fill it out? So that is something that is used in order to complete the form. You do have to complete that uh, about four days prior to doing your FAFSA form. And then that is also used to be able to sign the form electronically. So it's definitely something that the student, as well as the contributors to their application, which is typically their parents, uh, would need to do prior to doing the FAFSA form. Frederick, does it make sense for a family to consult either their financial advisor or perhaps their family accountant when they're filling out this form? Yes, it does. Um, like Diana mentioned, first of all, you have to uh, you have to show all your assets, uh, your income. Um, so if you have assets with your financial advisor, your financial advisor can help you uh, retrieve all the statements, all the account values. Uh, but also there could be some strategies. Everybody's different. Everybody's in a different situation. So there might be a strategy that's applicable to, to a certain person where the financial advisor can, can step in and help. How does the filer determine whether they're dependent or independent, and does it impact how much uh, financial aid they may receive? 
So if a student is dependent, then that means they're also going to be taking into consideration the parent's income and assets when determining eligibility for need-based aid. The FAFSA has a series of questions on it to determine whether a student is dependent or independent. So it'll ask the student questions like um, whether or not they're 24, whether or not they're an orphan or a ward of the court, um, whether or not they're a veteran. So it's various questions on the FAFSA that they'll be asked and then the form will determine their dependency status based on how they answer those questions. Can you talk a little bit more about deadlines? When is the FAFSA available and how far in advance? So I'll, I'll say, for example, for selfish reasons, I have a student who's a junior. Um, anticipation is my, my daughter will be graduating in May 25. Mm -hmm. She'd be going to school fall 25. Should we start thinking about that this fall? You can't, the students can't fill out the FAFSA form until their senior year in high school. Usually the FAFSA is available uh, every year on October 1st. This previous year, there was a delay based on them doing something called FAFSA simplification where they reduced a lot of the questions on the form. So this past year, it was available on December 31st. However, on a typical year, it should be available on studentaid.gov on October 1st. Um, so you really can't uh, start filling out the form any sooner than that during the senior year in high school. Have there been any challenges uh, arisen as a result of the delay? There has been, there has been challenges. Um, there has been different delays that have happened due to the processing with the new form. Uh, so right now, um, you know, a lot of people have completed the form, but if people have not completed the FAFSA form, they should still go online and complete that form as soon as possible. Is there a benefit to filing earlier? Uh, it, I, we always suggest that people complete the FAFSA as soon as possible. Then that way, the earlier that the school can receive that information, then you can get your financial aid offer to determine what type of financial aid may be available to you. We're going to continue our discussion in just a moment. But first, I'd like to give our guests a brief break and tell you about what's coming up on PCN. The PCN Capital Preview returns tomorrow morning as we discuss the State House legislative agenda with Representatives Dan Frankel and Russ Diamond. That's tomorrow morning live at 9 o'clock. Join us for On the Issues this week as we're joined by Lauren Cristella, President and CEO of the Committee of 70, followed by Maria Montero, a Republican seeking the nomination for the 7th Congressional District. That's Wednesday night starting at 7. Join PCN for primary election night coverage next week. We'll bring you incoming poll results interviews from campaign headquarters, and commentary from political experts. Tuesday, April 23rd, starting live at 8.30 p.m. All the great public affairs event coverage and interviews you watch at PCN are now available for free online at PCNTV.com and on PCN Select. Thank you for watching PCN. PCN is a 501c3 nonprofit television network that receives no government funding. We're relying on viewers and donors like you to help PCN continue to bring you everything Pennsylvania. To make a donation, visit PCNTV.com. As we return to our discussion on paying for college, I'd like to remind our viewers you're welcome to join in with your questions or comments. You can call us toll free at 1-877-PA6501 or text your questions to us at 717-219-4001. We have another question that came in via text. Should all families fill out FAFSA even if they make too much money? Absolutely. Everyone should be filling out the FAFSA if you want to receive any type of assistance uh, for college. Even if the family believes that maybe their income and assets might be, they think that it might be too high to qualify for need-based aid such as grants, if the student uh, or the parent decides to take out any type of federal student loans, you do have to fill out the FAFSA form prior to taking out federal student loans. So you definitely want to fill out the FAFSA form. You could also be missing out on institutional aid, which is free money directly from the colleges, because a lot of times they will want the FAFSA form to be completed prior to awarding any type of aid that, like that. Are there general income parameters that parents should be aware of when they're considering whether or not they might be eligible for financial aid? There is not a, a per se uh, income cutoff because the formula does look at a variety of different things. So they do look at the income, they also look at the assets, but they also look at things like the family size. So all families, regardless of income, should still complete the FAFSA form. Is financial aid weighted in any way if a family has more than one child in college simultaneously? So that's actually something that used to be part of the federal needs analysis. Uh, they actually took it out of the needs analysis for this school year. 
However, it is something that maybe colleges might be able to consider when determining institutional aid. So if you do have more than one student in college, I would definitely make the financial aid office aware at the college because they may want to consider that. And if you have more than one student in college, do you fill out a FAFSA form for each individual child? Yes. Each student fills out their own individual FAFSA form. What is the expected financial contribution? How's that determined? So the, 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 actually, the expected family contribution is no longer used. Um, because of the FAFSA simplification process that took place this year, um, that is now referred to as a student aid index. And it's basically a calculation that's determined from the income and the assets and family size and other factors that is put on the FAFSA form. And then um, the Department of Education derives a figure that the colleges use in determining um, financial aid eligibility. And so the colleges will use that figure to determine uh, how much aid or how much need the student has. If you're filling out the FAFSA for the first time for a high school senior um, who'll be heading into college but they haven't committed yet, how many school options are you permitted to provide? You can actually put up to 20 different schools on the FAFSA form now. That's also another new enhancement that they made this year. Once you fill out the FAFSA, are there opportunities to make changes if there's a significant financial change, for example, if someone changes jobs, loses a job, something like that? Yes. What we recommend that families do and you come, if you come across that situation is to actually reach out to the financial aid office at the college and let them know there's been a change of circumstance. You can also make corrections on the FAFSA, but we recommend that you contact the financial aid office at the college, let them know that there's been a job loss or a decrease in income, and then they can work with you in order to um, change that with their needs analysis. You can also reach out to FIA if the student is being considered for a Pennsylvania State grant. In general, is there a financial benefit to attending an in-state school? I mean, that's a decision uh, that all families have to make. I think that there is um, some financial incentives to uh, go to an in-state school because typically uh, you'll get a discount on tuition if you go to a school that's within your state. Uh, but that's not the only thing that you know, families want to consider, but there would be a financial incentive for that. And can you talk a little bit about the GPA threshold? Once you're pr uh, provided a financial aid package, where does GPA run into that? So every student does have to be making um, academic progress in order to maintain financial aid, and that's something that they would want to uh, look at with their college so that they can be aware of what that school's satisfactory academic progress standard is. Let's talk a little bit about some other free money options. You mentioned uh, grants. So what kind of grants are available to students and where do they look for them? So the free application for federal student aid is going to be that main form they fill out. That will determine if they qualify for the federal Pell Grant, also the FSEOG grant, which is another federal grant that students can qualify for. Uh, once the student fills out the FAFSA form and FIA sends them their state grant application, there is a Pennsylvania state grant that students could qualify for. So the main things the students want to do is make sure they fill out the FAFSA for any federal grants. And then we will actually send them the state grant application to see if they qualify for the Pennsylvania state grant. And what is the largest grant that FIA awards to students? It is the Pennsylvania state grant. How can a student find these grants once again? Um, so they will want to fill out the free application for federal student aid, and they can do that on studentaid.gov. And then our website is FIA.org, and students can find out more about the Pennsylvania State Grant as well as additional uh, specialty grants that we also administer. Can you talk a little bit about how scholarships fit into this as well and where students can, can look to start seeking those out? So scholarships are definitely things that students should make sure that they're doing. Uh, we recommend that students really focus in on local scholarships. Those scholarships are going to have less competition. The best resource for finding out about local scholarships is the student's high school counselor. They're going to be made aware by all of the different organizations that are offering local scholarships, and then they will make the student aware on how to apply for those. We also recommend that students apply for national scholarships. One of the uh, good websites that we recommend is fastweb.com. That is a national scholarship website where students can create a profile, and it will help match up scholarships to things that the student is already interested in or going to get involved in. The other way that students can obtain scholarships is directly through the colleges themselves. So they should reach out to their financial aid office at the college to see if there's any scholarships that they can apply for. They can also look on the college's website and go under the financial aid part of their website to see if they're advertising any scholarships there as well. Will receipt of a scholarship affect other types of financial aid? Um, 
it, it could, depending on the school. So sometimes scholarships can have an effect on institutional aid, which is free money that the colleges offer. So if a family is concerned about that, they should definitely reach out to the financial aid office to see if having a private scholarship might impact that. Let's take a phone call now. George is calling from York. Go ahead, sir. Yes, thank you for the program there. Uh, very interesting. Uh, our, we've had a 529 plan for our son. He's going to get through uh, four years of undergraduate, and also he's uh, you know, in vet school right now, and he's going to walk out of there with little or no debt, thanks to the a lot in part to the 529 plan. Uh, so it's a great thing. Uh, one one thing I would say uh, is, you know, one of the things that bothers me about the filling out the FAFSA form is, you know, like the major universities, you have to fill that out. Okay, even if you know your income is going to be above any kind of financial aid. And what concerns me is there's all kinds of information. I remember maybe they changed that now, but I mean, it was just ridiculous. I mean, what's the value of your business? What assets do you own? I mean, it was intense because my wife and I both have small businesses. And I thought that's really none of your business. I mean, you can see my tax return and what have you. But that said, the other thing is that I'd like to say with the national uh Loans. I don't know why there's the percentage. The percent is so high on them. I mean, I don't know why they can't give students loans. They talk about all the student loan debt. Uh, you know, why can't they do one or two percent? I mean, these things are averaging like I don't know. They were like ten percent. So I'm not sure if anything can be done about that. But it just seems kind of ridiculous. The federal government's you know loaning students money at ten percent, which is the taxpayers. I mean, why can't we offer them a better interest rate? Uh, anyway, just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, George. Any comments for our caller? I would say the the, um, the interest rates right now for the uh, federal subsidized loan, I think, is a little bit about 5%. The unsubsidized loan is a little bit about 7%, and the federal parent plus loan is 8.05%. The one thing that people have to watch for is um, the, uh, the student um, unsubsidized loan and the parent plus loan, the interest will start accruing right away. So they give you the option to start repayment after the child graduates, but the interest starts right away. So sometimes that can creep up if you don't pay attention to it. And then when you graduate, you have to start repaying your loan. The balance is not higher than what you think it is or what it was when you first borrowed um, the money for the tuition. Let's take a step back. Diona, can you talk us through the different type of student loans that are available and which parents should look for? So there are federal loans that students can take out. Um, it, there are an unsubsidized loan, which is where a student is responsible for the interest while they're in school. And then there's a subsidized loan where the government pays the interest while the student is in school. Whether or not a student gets a subsidized or an unsubsidized loan is going to be based off of the information provided on the FAFSA form. There is also another loan called a Parent PLUS loan that parents can take out for their students. Uh, that loan, uh, this, they do do a credit check and then determine in the, based on that, uh, the parents can take out a Parent PLUS loan from the federal government. And then they do have different interest rates and there's also different fees that are taken out of the loans prior to that. In addition to that, there are private student loans uh, that students and families can pursue. And those are loans that can be obtained from a local bank, credit union. FIA also has a private student loan called PA Forward. Um, and then there are various other private loans that people can also find uh, online. Virgil, can you talk a little bit about the responsibility that's tied to serving as a co-signer for such a loan? Well, for some of the loans, uh, for the student loans, it's under the student's name. Uh, for the federal uh, parent plus, also some private loans. Um, and the FIA loans also can be um, under the parent's name or co-signed by the parent. So obviously the responsibility is if at some point, uh, if it's under the child's name and they don't make the payments, then you're on the hook for, for those payments. Um, just like you can co-sign for if a child wants to buy a car or a house and they don't have the credit, you can co-sign for uh, further loans, but the responsibility can be on you as well. If a student's having problems paying back their loans once they're out of school, under what circumstances can they receive loan forgiveness? Uh, so there are various different loan, federal, federal, uh, federal loan forgiveness programs out there. Um, they have one for teachers. There's also a public service loan forgiveness program for students that are going into a public service type of job. 
Uh, so those are probably two of the biggest uh, reasons for loan forgiveness. In addition to that, there are different repayment plans that students can use when they go on a federal uh, student loan repayment plan. They are called income-driven repayment plans. And then based on what type of plan you're on, you can also receive loan forgiveness after you've been in repayment uh, for a certain am amount of years. Can you talk just briefly about the different types of repayment programs and you know circumstances where you think one option might be a better Sure. Better so there are income-driven repayment plans, and those are payment plans that students can take out, and they, the servicer of their loan will look at their income information, and then they'll derive a payment based off of their discretionary income. Uh, there's also a standard repayment plan. That is what the student would get automatically if they don't choose another repayment plan. Uh, they, that plan will have the student pay the loan off within 10 years of taking the loan out. So their payment would be based off of that repayment plan schedule. There's also a graduated repayment plan, which it, was, will, it will be a plan where it will start off with a lower monthly payment and then it will grow over time. Um, on a particular schedule. So there's a lot of different options that students have available to them to help with repayment. We also recommend that students really have close contact with their student loan servicer. So if they're running into any issues, communicate that with your servicer because there are also different deferments and forbearances that students could also get for federal student loans depending on their circumstances. Frederick, what kind of financial advice would you give a young adult, whether they're a college student or perhaps a recent graduate, and they're just kind of out on their own for the first time? Um, as a college, well, first of all, is uh, besides uh, school loans, uh, when you get into the real life, is try to stay away from debt. Um, start saving for your own retirement early once you graduate. And one of the benefits from the 529 plans uh, that's new is that if you have any leftover money from your 529 plan that you haven't used yet, you can roll that over. Um, th there's certain rules, but you can roll some of that over into a Roth IRA. So I would be looking at doing that. Um, when you're in college, um, obviously you might not have the money to to start saving if you have to pay for your own education and you and then some of your your own expenses. Um, but I would try to say maybe start repaying some of that loan um, while you're in school, if you can. Um, that goes to the parents also. Um, but if you can start paying down some of that loan or some of that interest that's been accruing, um, try to, to do that while you're in school so you have a lower amount of debt when you get out of school and when you graduate. Do you have any guidelines regarding how much money a student should borrow? I don't really have any guidelines. I mean, it depends. I, I would say um, try to keep it as low as possible. But if you want to, if you want to go to a certain school because you want to, uh, you you have to be in a certain program, and that's the only school that gives it, and it's a little bit more expensive than what you'd like. You, and if that's what you do, that's fine. But I would say when you choose your your school so when you get that financial aid letter that diana was talking about from the school where you applied if you apply to four or five different schools you'll get four or five different letters and then you'll see what your expected out-of-pocket costs will be and and um, i think it's it's worth looking at all those options and maybe considering a lower out-of-pocket cost uh, school versus a higher out-of-pocket uh, cost school. So at the end of the day, you have to borrow less money and you have more um, when you graduate. I'd like to ask you a similar question. Do you have any guidelines for how much someone should borrow? That's all going to be different based on that student's individual circumstance. Um, but as he said, borrow as little as possible. Exhaust the free money first, and that's why we always go back to look for and apply for as many scholarships as possible. I believe I saw a statistic the other day that said about $100 million in scholarship money goes wasted every year because of lack of applicants. So I, we can't emphasize enough, you wanna exhaust the gift aid, that free money first, and then that's when you, and then if you have exhausted that, then that's when you want to look at student loans. What should families keep in mind when they're comparing school costs? You definitely want to look at, again, what your out-of-pocket costs are. 
So what does that school cost minus any free money that's being offered, including scholarships, grants, and any institutional aid that the school can offer? And then whatever is left over is what you're responsible for. Also keep in mind when you're looking at the financial aid offer that those costs are per year. So you want to times that by however long it's going to take for the student to graduate. Also keep in mind that if the student changes their major, it could take them more than four years to get a bachelor's degree. So when you're deciding on a school, you want to take all of those things into consideration. Do you have any recommendations or tools for how a family can keep track of all the different financial aid pieces that are kind of happening concurrently? Ooh, um, I think that there are some different tools out there. Um, you can take a look at our website, FIA.org. Um, we have different award comparison uh, spreadsheets and brochures that families can keep track of information. Studentaid.gov also has some additional resources out there. So check out our website as well as studentaid.gov, uh, FIA.org and studentaid.gov for those resources. And one last question, once students graduate, are there any tax incentives or recommendations you have to help them as they're starting to pay back those loans? Um, I can't think of any tax incentives. I do know, though, if the student gets the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, for example, uh, there is no federal tax liability on that. So that is a good incentive um, if people want to do pursue that loan forgiveness program. Deanna Brown, manager of the Pennsylvania School Services at Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency, and Frederick Cassivi, financial advisor at Wealth Management Services. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you. PCN's Larry Casper spoke with Representative Danilo Burgos about his legislation that would give driver's licenses to illegal immigrants. Why is this bill important to your constituents? Uh, because uh, it's about equality. Uh, it's about um, helping uh, undocumented people be able to pay taxes locally um, and for the safety of all of our roads. Uh, talk about the daily challenges of a, of a person who isn't allowed to have a driver's license. Well, they're not able to take your child to school. They're not able to go to work. Um, as we all know, uh, especially in the sector of agriculture, and manufacturing, and, and meat processing, uh, they use a lot of uh, uh, labor force comes from, um, from, from immigrants. Some of them are documented, some of them are not documented. Uh, we can measure this through what's called an I-10, an individual taxpayer identification number, of which uh, the federal government a few years ago received over $15 billion. And our states uh, also receive contributions from undocumented people through I-10 numbers. How so, often, uh, Representative, how often do uh, immigrants, uh, illegal or otherwise, who don't have a valid license, uh, take a chance and, and just try to go to work anyway. What kind of anecdotal information or stories do you have for us? Well, you have a parent that uh, could be taking his child to school that have been pulled over. Uh, it's happened here in Philadelphia. It's happened uh, uh, in Cumberland County. It's happened in Dolphin County. Um, numerous stories where a person is just living their life day to day. They're being a positive individual in their respective community, and they get pulled over. They're asking for the documentation. They don't have any. Hmm. So then it, it elevates the, the process to a larger investigation, a broader investigation. Now, this person could, could most likely is already part of the uh, community that's, uh, that they live in, and it disrupts. Um, I've heard, uh, I sit on the Agricultural Committee and Vice Chair for, for the Democrats in the Agriculture Committee. And from traveling the state, I've heard it many of times throughout our state in, in rural areas where uh, the immigrant hand is it's vital to make sure that the crops are harvested on time, the fields are worked, and that our milk gets to our homes. So tell us the details of your proposal. Just how would it work? So it, first of all, it would have to be the person, someone that is uh, already has uh, requested an individual taxpayer identification number. This, this will allow the person to pay taxes not only to the federal government, but to their local municipality uh, and have a documentation, a biometric uh, identification uh, from their country of origin. Uh, most of the country, all of the countries that are 
uh, of friendly to the United States of America already reproduced documentations that has biometric uh, information on their documentation. Mm-hmm. And we can, we can use this documentation. Not to mention, we already have Maryland, Virginia, New York, and New Jersey that already allow for a driver's license and IDs for undocumented people mm-hmm. for the purpose of driving. It sounds like your legislation would benefit the just immigrants that are already on the path to citizenship. Is that right? That's the intent. Um, and, but most importantly, it will benefit our local municipalities. They're at this moment do not have an avenue mm-hmm. to in, to to allow for an increase of tax base. Mm-hmm. And which by sta- having people that by Sorry. having uh, more citizens that are more. More citizens, more, uh, more more constituents that are able to pay taxes locally, you're going to increase the coffers of the municipalities. At this time, we don't have a vehicle to do so. Uh, which step in the driver's license application process uh, is the roadblock here? Can you tell us? It's at the initial. Uh, if you do not have a social security number, uh, you're not allowed to apply. Mm-hmm. And if you cannot produce uh, information about your uh, uh, documented status, you're not allowed to apply. But we don't ask them that when they come to work in, in a field, uh, in, on a farm, in a meat processing plant, um, there's countless uh, jobs that are being filled by undocumented people that are contributing to uh, the overall economy. And let's uh, explore that, Representative. Just how important is immigrant labor to Pennsylvania's economy overall? Well, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the meat processing plants didn't stop. The farming uh, industry didn't stop. Mm-hmm. The milk producing industry didn't stop. We all ate during the pandemic, thanks to in large uh, part to the undocumented hand of immigrants. Mm-hmm. Um, we all know that unfortunately, the federal government does not provide an adequate number of uh, legal visas, work visas, um, and because, thanks to the economy of our state being so strong and vibrant, uh, it's a bit huge draw to immigration, mm-hmm. whether legal or, or, or undocumented. And if Pennsylvania uh, lost its foreign-born workforce, uh, there would certainly be consequences, wouldn't there? It would devastate our economy. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. And even right now, with the, uh, even with our current population, we, want, we do not have enough people to fill all the job slots that we have available. So bring us up to date. Uh, Last question on on where the bill stands and any uh, challenges you might anticipate from the next chamber, which would be the Senate. So right now the bill is in the the Transportation Committee. Um, We are negotiating negotiating so that we can hopefully move it out of of the committee this session and onto the floor. Um, And in anticipation from the Senate are the, the, that farce that people with IDs can vote. Um, that's not true. If you're, uh, if you're not a United States citizen and by whatever reason you are allowed to vote, you immediately, you're giving up your, your right to become a United States citizen. That's your, that's part of uh, your background check when you go to become, when you apply to become a United States citizen. So I do not know of anyone that will give up the right to become a, the potential to potentially become a United States citizen just for a single vote. Representative Danilo Burgos, thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes today's show. On the next episode of the PCN Capital Preview, we'll talk about State House legislative agenda with Representatives Dan Frankel and Russ Diamond. That's tomorrow morning, starting live at 9 a.m. I'm Francine Scherzer. Thank you for watching.